Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Gracious and ever loving God, be with us now as we study our brothers and sisters in the past. Help us to understand, empathize, believe with them, realizing that we all are dependent upon you. In Christ's name. I have been, uh, this is the third of a three-part series, and as you may recall, uh, I've been lecturing more than I normally would do, uh, or would like to do, because I've tried to cover a great deal. And I'm also not telling you sort of the standard history, instead we're focusing on what are the background beliefs, what are the sort of assumptions, the way people look at life and look at uh, their uh, 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 religion. And, and try to have a, a, an appreciation of that adage that the past is like a foreign country. They do, they do things differently there. And as you recall, I pointed out that uh, we have more in common with our Catholic brothers and sisters than we do with our Lutheran forebears of the 16th century. Uh, in fact, we have more in common with our Jewish brothers and sisters in some ways than we do with our Lutheran forebears because Although you would think that couldn't possibly be true, but there's so many things that we just take for granted today um, in the way we think about the world uh, that would have uh, astounded, or probably they wouldn't have been able to comprehend uh, the sorts of things we simply take for granted. Uh, we're now going to talk about the Reformation. The first time we talked about the Catholic Church, you know, the Western Catholic Church in the late medieval, early modern period has its own integrity. We talked about Martin Luther and the Reformation uh, last week. And by the way, if you missed any of these and are a glutton for punishment, uh, they are available on the web. If you go to the uh, Holy Trinity site, click on the Connect and go to Adult Forums, and you will get to uh, uh, see me in all my glory. Um, the, uh, what we, to summarize a few things and to highlight I've been trying to deal with certain background beliefs, with think commonsensical assumptions about how you're saved, about human being, about how government works, how the world works. We're going to have to do a little more theology this time because we're going to be actually looking at how this the, the movement that starts with Martin Luther very quickly uh, spreads and, and diversifies and becomes a variety of different movements, some of whom uh, will have nothing to do with other parts of it. So, uh, uh, we're going to be looking at Reformation. That's why I made that yellow and put an underline under it. Uh, to just remind you, uh, Scripture is used by all of these various traditions in its own way. And so what I try to do is point out that, yes, we Lutherans interpret it this way, but you know, the Reformed or the Catholics have the Scripture too, and they can reach different uh, conclusions, and it would be hard to say, just on the basis of Scripture, who is more faithful to Scripture. We talked about salvation, and you know, the, the Philippians comment here is uh, work out uh, your uh, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. But what we how we interpret that among those various traditions, especially as we go from the original Evangelish or Evangelicals, which were the Lutherans, and then they start moving out into spiritualists and, and certain sectarian groups, and then you start having the Reform, and then the Reform starts subdividing. Um, you have to realize that though all of these different traditions have certain things in common, but they put the stress in different places. Every one of these Christian traditions, uh, up to the time of Lutherans, and including Reform, believed in predestination. That is, the belief that God, who is almighty, chooses those whom God is going to give the gift of grace. Because after all, faith is not something... Luther said, and the Catholic Church said, grace and faith is not something we create ourselves. We cannot of our own free will do that which is pleasing to God and earn our salvation. I mean, the old notion that the Pope uh, taught that you could be saved by works is easily misunderstood because even the works you do in the act of working out your salvation with fear and trembling within the Catholic Church are works done with divine assistance. The works you do on your own are worth nothing. So they all believed in predestination, but we start to have some people now, we'll see some groups that don't. In the Catholic Church, salvation was something that happened within the human being. But again, the sort of commonsensical notion is, if you're going to enter into God's sight, if God is going to accept you, 
you need to be acceptable. And God is good. God cannot accept bad people. Uh, you have to become good before you can enter into God's sight. So God, but you can't do that on your own, so God has done it for you through Christ. And then you actually become gradually better through gifts of grace, which is supernatural charity. It's an ability to love God above all things and the neighbor as yourself. It's something that gradually you become better at because God is helping you. And God is helping you in a variety of ways. One of the prime ways, I'm just you know, reviewing what we've talked about, one of the prime ways is the sacraments. Where you each, that's why they would have lots of masses said for a person. Uh, because every mass would add a little bit more supernatural charity. The, the notion is the human being has to become better. How does the human being become better? They become better uh, by uh, participating in the sacraments and then by doing good works while they're in a state of grace. The contract, as it were, some of the theologians said, was that God will give you an ability to love God and neighbor. And if you exercise that ability by actually loving God and neighbor, not perfectly, but better than you could otherwise, God will reward you with additional ability. And you gradually work out your salvation. Luther came along and said, no. You are justified, made right with God through faith in God's promise that Christ has died for you. It's, a, it's like a light switch, which someone is playing with in the back. <laughs> um, just, be trying to get, just trying to get more light. Right. Uh, and uh, if, if the Holy Spirit gives you the gift of faith and you believe Christ's promise, you are saved. You still are a sinner. That's why Luther talked about simultaneously righteous and a sinner. Simon is simultaneously good, righteous, right with God, not because you're all cleaned up, but because God has accepted you. Because God judges you on the basis of Christ rather than yourself. But you also uh, are still a sinner. And you still need to do good works, but the good works don't aren't the way you get to salvation. It's a sign of your gratitude for the fact that Christ has died for you. They are the, what are called the fruits of faith rather than the means of salvation. So you're justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Within the Lutherans, the original Evangelists, there's very early on some divisions that we'll be looking at here uh, in this 45 minutes or so. Uh, a lot have to do with the relationship between spirit and letter, spirit and flesh, material world and the spiritual world. Uh, these are divisions that actually are hard for us to understand today because we live so much in the material world. Uh, but it was something that, that uh, uh, divided a variety of the groups. And so again, I'm going to be trying to lay out for you some of the key ideas that underlay various divisions that occur uh, within the evangelical after the 1530s, the Protestant called the Protestant, or called Protestants because they protested the decision in 1529 that the emperor and the diet had made. So being called a Protestant uh, was a little like being called a teabagger. You know, there, it was something that people used to insult you. Uh, now, sometimes maybe you deserve insults, but <coughs> we won't go there. Uh, so a lot of the, the issue is uh, is how you understand spirit and letter, spirit and flesh, uh, heaven and earth, spirit and matter. Um, so for example, you have seven sacraments with the Catholics. And sacraments um, are in some way, they are material things, but they carry spiritual power. So uh, if you go and receive the sacraments, uh, receive the Mass, you're gaining some grace, which sort of moves you along in your progress towards salvation. You're getting a little better. It's like exercising, you know. You exercise your faith by going, you know, you go to the spa, you work out, and then you're a little stronger. Well, that's the same theory here. Uh, and so there's a way in which the, the sacrament, though, of the Mass, even just seeing the host, which is elevated, uh, strengthens you. But there's a lot more to it in this sort of belief that this, this is a, this is a way in which the spiritual is actually in the world. Uh, we today might say it's almost magical. So, for example, they would take the consecrated host, and on Corpus Christi Day, 
that means the body of Christ, body of Christ is the host, they put it in a box, put the box on a pole, and walk around the community singing hymns and, and what have you, and uh, bless the fields. And it was as if this physical thing, which is the body of Christ, could have almost uh, you know, a real effect on the world, what we might think almost as a magical effect on the world, but they wouldn't have thought it as magical. That's a just modern distinction that, that, sh you know, that will benefit the community. Or people could go to see relics, which contained, as it were, a form of spiritual energy. Uh, that you could go, and by um, uh, visiting relics and saying certain prayers, you could gain grace that could help you either in your progress towards heaven or help you uh, uh, help those who are in purgatory move along there. Uh, you could do you could do rosary or stations of the cross. And these are various ways in which you could gain grace. And so there's a way in which there is spiritual power in material things. There are also spiritual places. You know, you go on pilgrimage to some place. And as, a, as it were, God is closer there, more present. This is a way of thinking about the world, uh, whereas most of us today even think about the world in material terms. Uh, but in the, in the 16th century, whether you're Lutheran or Catholic or Reformed, the God was more present in things than today. But even there, there's a distinction. Because within a Catholic view of things, the cosmos was in some ways enchanted. I'm taking the term enchanted because scholars talk about disenchantment, the disenchanted world. We live in a disenchanted world where we understand things in terms of science, politics, economics. We don't expect... You know, when we speak of an act of God, it's a metaphor. When a storm would come in the 16th century, that was really an act of God. Um, you know, this is, it's not just sort of a legal term that the insurance company can use not to pay your premiums. Uh, but there is a, a, a growing group of, of more elite people, even before the Reformation starts, who are starting to call this superstitious relics, beating the boundaries of the town, blessing the fields, doing various things. That they're starting to think, you know, this is a this is this is too vulgar, this is too magical. There's something more involved uh, here. Go to the next slide. No, we didn't do it there. It's the right arrow. Or you can do the down key either one. There. Uh, still, we're still in the preliminary. Um, lucky people. Uh, the, one of the big issues that we'll use to sort of separate out the different movements is the question of authority. I mean, it's one thing to say we're all Christians, but then how do you figure out, well, this is really Christian and this is not? How do you decide? Uh, the answer that Christians gave, whether they were Catholics or Evangelicals, not Evangelicals in the American sense, but the Evangelish, the Protestants, whether they were uh, Anabaptists, we'll talk about that in a minute, or, or Lutherans, or Calvinists, or Reformed, uh, they all believed in the Bible. That was the source of authority. That's where you figured out. But the question is, is, although Luther liked to say theologically that the Bible interprets itself, Historians have to point out that if it interprets itself, it does a very bad job of it. Because people keep reading the Bible and coming up with different answers. Now, we, if, in a whole other series, we could talk about what it means to in the Bible to interpret itself. And Luther had a good, sophisticated answer, which is probably good for Lutherans to know. We don't have time for that. I just want to point out is that the Catholics would look at the Bible and they would come up with one answer. The Lutherans would look at the Bible and come up with another. The Anabaptists, which we'll talk about in a moment, would look at it and come up with a third. Luther would even look at the same Bible and come up with different uh, uh, answers, you know, depending on the context in which he was looking at it. Luther was a faculty member, and the saying about faculty members is three faculty members, five opinions. <laughs> uh, so who, does inter who interprets it? Well, the Catholic Church itself, as you recall from the first lecture, disagreed on who got to interpret the Bible. Was it the Pope or the Magisterium? Or was it the Council? 
which is the assembled bishops? Or was it both the, the Pope and the councils? This was not a decided issue in the 15th and the 16th century. It didn't really get decided until a couple centuries later. And there are Catholics to this day, especially those Catholics influenced by Vatican II, who for a time thought that maybe we we're moving, the Catholic Church was moving back towards a more, we might call it a constitutional or a legislative view of who gets to interpret. So that was one possibility. Well, if you don't have a pope or councils, and remember Luther when he made his famous speech at the Diet of Worms, you know, the Here I Stand speech where he didn't say Here I Stand, <laughs> um, but it was in the printed version. Uh, he said, he, I, believe, I trust neither in popes nor councils because they have manifestly erred and contradicted themselves. Well, the historian would say, yes, that's true. And Luther was, for the 16th century, a pretty sophisticated historian. In other ways, from our modern perspective, he was a very unsophisticated historian. But history, modern way of looking at history and seeing that times have changed and comparing things, was really in its early stages. This is the, one of the beginnings of the modern way of looking at things, is actually in the Reformation. And so uh, he said, look, at the Pope has said one thing one time and another thing another time, and they fought with councils about it. Who's right? Um, and, and of course, he said, I'm right. But uh, uh, And he had explanation for why it was. But uh, in practice, if we're looking at sort of institutionally, who, who comes next? Well, in Lutheranism, it was the university professors. <laughs> That's a scary thought. <laughs> it's a little like looking at you today. I often say to my economics colleagues, economist colleagues who don't like it at all, they're the modern theologians. They have all the authority and power. They don't know what's coming. <laughs> but they think they do. Uh, well, you know, it's kind of scary to think that the university. But in practice, it turned out to be the rulers who often did it. If it wasn't the Pope and the Council, it was the rulers. So, we, you all, how many of you heard of the, the, confe the Augsburg Confession? Right? That's, that's a key Lutheran document. Was it Luther that confessed it and established it? No. Was it Melanchthon who wrote it, who did it? No. It was the princes and the city-states before the emperor who said, this is our confession. So they are the ones that actually ended up deciding. Henry VIII in England, you know, the one who had the problem. Uh, <laughs> he establishes his, the church, and he acts as the, as the father of the church, the you know, with the almost divine authority. There are pictures of the so-called Great Bible in the late 1530s with Henry on the front, you know, on the throne, and he's handing out the Bible, you know, to his his people. And he's actually handing the Cramner who's handing it out to other folks. Um, so there's this notion that, well, actually, in practice, it's the rulers that decide. And in the middle of the 16th century, a few years after Luther dies in 1555, there's they develop a document called Cuius Regio Eos Religio. And of course, I don't have to translate that for anyone here. <laughs> he who rules his religion. And it was essentially the doctrine that, all right, rather than fighting with each other, we'll just say the prince gets to decide. That didn't work, because princes then changed their minds. Some of them were Lutheran, became Reformed. Some of them were Lutheran, became Catholic, and there were wars, and a whole range of things. But basically, uh, the authority in practice was, and remember, the Pope was essentially a ruler too. He was the he had large territories in Italy, and church and state were, in any case, all intertwined. You couldn't separate them the way we can today. Um, there was another group that appealed to the spirit. I have had a revelation. This is the truth. Uh, they were not very popular and got into serious trouble. Uh, as they started fighting with each other, all of them referring to the Bible, they developed something which is very modern, but it had its origins in this period of the next couple hundred years, which is proof texting. Now remember, 95% of the population in the 16th century could not read. There was not a standard version of the Bible. Uh, they hadn't developed biblical critical understanding of the Greek text or the Hebrew text. Um, but they actually, early in the 17th century, finally came up with verse numbers. A printer said, oh, this would be nifty, I'll add numbers. Think about how hard it is to cite something if you don't have numbers. How many of you have Kindles? 
anyone have a Kindle? How many know what a Kindle is? Okay. Kindles uh, are at Amazon.com selling this electronic book, which is that you can download books immediately. And they, they've asked a number of schools, including Princeton University, to see whether this would work with textbooks. And they have big ones and little Kindles. And it, the, the test of the big one with textbooks is not going at all well because there's no pagination. <laughs> How do you cite? I've got the thing for page 26. Well, you can't because the Kindle doesn't, because you can change the font size on a Kindle. So if you make the font size bigger, you get fewer words on the page. You make it smaller, you get more words. So it doesn't know where the page is. And if someday they're going to have to put in there what the page is on the hard copy version, or else academics will never be able to use it. Because academics, part of being an academic is that somebody else can go check what you said. And if you make it very hard to check, you're not a good academic. Next slide. Uh, I just mentioned that Bible reading, you know, we have this picture often that pious Lutherans talk about Luther discovered the Bible changed with dust all over, chained in the library, and he gave it to the people. Well, that's uh, not right in a number of ways. Uh, one, he was given a Bible when he became a monk. Every monk was given a Bible. They were very expensive, pre printing. I mean, the cost of, a, of, a, of an automobile today would be about what it cost to buy a Bible. Very expensive to print. But most people were not literate. So the pious notion that Luther came along and thereafter the family sat around the table and read the Bible to each other is true only in the uh, 17th century with the rise of pietism. So the proof texting, I had Aristotle on there too, the, using a very close syllogi syllogistic logic so you could prove something from citing scripture. Luther hated Aristotle. So there's a great irony that Aristotle comes back. Um, the, the type of literalism that we think of today, biblical literalism, inciting text and proving arguments, develops in the 17th and the 18th century in some respects among the elite, and it doesn't get to the popular level to any great extent uh, until later. So a lot of the biblical literalism that we deal with today, people who say the world was created in six days, in six nights, in the same size day, that's actually, that idea came in 1843, uh, in its present form in the United States uh, and a particular movement. And that, people had to have Bibles that had verse numbers and they had to have a particular way of thinking about it before that sort of argument made sense. Okay, now we're going to start looking at, and I'm going real fast so you have to say, <laughs> stop, I have a question. Do you have a question? Okay. Um, one of the big questions now, the, the evangelicals are breaking away from the Roman church, being helped mainly by the rulers, who both are pious in some cases, and in other cases they just want to control everything in their territory, including religion. Remember we discussed before the, the, the role of community? That is, we are individualists today. You, know, you believe this, you believe that. But they were communitarians in a certain sense. Uh, they believe the whole community had to believe the same thing. What would happen if you, if the whole community didn't believe the same thing? If some people didn't believe, say there were a few Jews in your Christian community, what would happen? What would happen to the community? What would God do? Yeah, an act of God, God would come along and smite them. It's blasphemy. You were allowing people who are wrong and sinful within your community. Part of you know, going around with the Corpus Christi was also to define what the community was. They believed that everyone had to believe the same same thing, or God would come along and punish you. This is the, the remember, it's the uh, Pat Roberts argument about 9/11, because we tolerate feminists, gays, and lesbians. That's why we had 9/11. This is a, at the time that seemed like a fairly strange argument. I think it is a very strange argument, but it would have made sense to the 16th century in a way it doesn't uh, to us uh, today. But now we've got, we've got the Catholic Church, and we've got these new evangelicals, and they start dividing. And the question naturally arises, well, what is the church? Who is the community? How can you tell? The Catholics say, we are the true church. We, uh, the Pope has been the head of the church all the way back to Peter. And the, the church is visible. Its, it's fullness is in the magisterium, and the Pope, or in the Pope in the Curia. And that's the church. 
Well, Luther has to answer that. He says, no, the church, there's two types of churches. There's the visible and the invisible church. The visible church is, of course, this group here. It's any group of people coming together um, where the uh, word is rightly preached and the sacraments rightly exercised. It's the definition. Uh, and that's, that's the church. Now, good people and bad people are in the church. Some of you are going to hell with be the Lutheran argument. Or once would have been. In other words, the good and the bad, the, the tares and the wheat, are in the same community. The invisible church is the true church, which only God knows. It's throughout all of, t of space and all of time. Those are the ones that God, remember predestination? God has chosen who will ultimately be saved. So, uh, one of the first issues is what, all right, Fair enough, there's an invisible church that we don't know who it is, but how can we identify the visible church? The Catholics said, look at the hierarchy and the Pope, the institution. The Lutherans said, look at that place where the word is rightly preached and the sacraments rightly administered. Sacraments being only two. What are they? In the Eucharist. In the Eucharist. And the Lord's Supper. And the new reform group I had to decide what order to define the reform, and I'm following this particular. They come along and say, well, there's a third mark of the church. I love this expression, marks of the church. <laughs> Being a mark. <laughs> what is the third mark? Does anyone know? In the reform tradition, if the first two marks, the reform share the two, it's word properly preached, sacraments rightly administered, what do you think is the third? Anyone here who's been a Presbyterian or a Dutch reform or... Ah, I don't know. <laughs> Discipline rightly exercised. That is, the church has to be disciplined in some way. That is, people have to be behaving themselves, and the people who are notorious sinners are kept from the Eucharist and are kicked out of the church or forced to behave themselves again. Again, it's the notion of the purity of the group. Uh, so, Lutherans and Calvinists and Catholics said the church was the visible church was the whole society. And then you had to deal with the people who were not behaving properly. But there's another group that comes along and says, no. The true church are those who hear the shepherd's voice and follow him. It's a remnant, a small remnant. There's lots of language in the scriptures to talk about it. And these, we, uh, these people said the true church are those who choose of their own free will to believe God. Free will. Now that wouldn't, that wouldn't have gone very well uh, among the other majority groups. And they said, look at a baptism. You baptize an infant, the infant doesn't know anything. You sprinkle a little water on him, per, um, and you know, it's just an infant. They don't, can't even speak yet. The true church is made up of people who profess that Christ, you know, that, that Jesus is my Savior. And I believe that he's died and risen for me. Sounds like Baptists today, right? Well, they weren't Baptists in the 16th century. They said that the true church is made up of those adults who made a commitment. And that the infant baptism was just a joke. And so, when you were an adult, if you profess your, your faith, you would be baptized into the true church, which is this small community. Now, they would say that the infant baptism was a joke and wasn't a real baptism. Uh, but the larger society said, now wait a minute, that was a real baptism, you're rebaptizing. You might say, yeah, the word Anabaptist means rebaptizer. And you think, well, why would they call it, why would they make this fuss about rebaptizing? Well, the answer is, is that back from the imperial law, which held in much of of uh, Europe, or some form of imperial law. That's Roman imperial law, back from the 4th and 5th century, more than a thousand years earlier, had dealt with something called the Donatists, which was a particular group of Christians in northern Africa, who went out and said, the rest of you, when, when persecution came, you all fell away. You had to be rebaptized to be a true Christian. And the emperor, and people like Augustine and what have you, said no. And they didn't fool around with these Donatists, they executed them. Uh, and so by calling these people who said adult baptism and conversion, calling them rebaptizers, then imperial law, Roman imperial law, 
would apply and they could be executed. Isn't that charming? Uh, uh, and again, you have a few Anabaptists in your community. The common assumption is that you have to uh, have a pure community. If you tolerate Anabaptists or rebaptizers or in the community, uh, God will punish you, so you have to do something about it. Uh, the Anabaptists sort of returned the compliment by saying, you are all going to hell, you're not really the church, we're the true church, we withdraw from society. And then they turned, and this is another scene that will come up, they looked at the, the book of Acts and some of the Pauline letters and said, we need to have a church just like the church then, which is a small remnant within a larger society, and we have to do all of the things that, that, uh, that early church did. And remember, let's harken back to two lessons ago, two small farms ago. Uh, we talked about the way that there is the commandments, the Ten Commandments, remember? Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt honor your mother and father, blah, blah, blah. And there are the councils. Turn the other cheek, bless those who persecute you, uh, sell all your possessions and give them away and follow me. And what did the Catholic Church do with these two sets of commandments, or suggestions, or councils? The lady and the priest. Yeah, the lady got the commandments. And the, and the clergy, which would be priests, monks, and nuns, got both. So if priests were expected not to shed blood to turn the other cheek, that's why if you could prove that you were a, a member of the clergy by saying certain Latin verses, you couldn't be executed because you were under a clerical jurisdiction and the clerics could not execute. That was called the noose verse in England. <laughs> if, you could, if you could say that to prove that you were educated sufficiently to be a cleric, remember, clerk and cleric are from the same root. A person who's literate so it wasn't mean that you were necessarily a priest, but you were literate, and then you were, so you wanted, you wanted to be able to say that in this verse, because they executed people for a lot more things than we do um, today. But they handled this thing by saying, no, clergy do both commandments and councils, lay people do just uh, commandments. The Anabaptists come along and say, no, we do it all, but we do it by in our small community. So we don't pay in the state, because the state uses force, it uses it wages war, so these people are pacifists. They can you know, turn the other cheek with on that. And they can do it by being a small group, as long as the large group doesn't get a hold of them. Mark, Mark? Yes? Was confirmation in the picture at all at that time? Or? No. Yeah. No, uh, confirmation, uh, uh, well, I mean, yes and no. There was the confirming of faith in, in your early teen, the type of training catechetical training and what have you is part of the story I'll be telling you in the next couple slides and that comes up later um, and that's church discipline that is in these small communities they discipline each other if someone in an Adam Actus community um, you know picked up the sword or did certain things on behalf of the state they were expelled next slide all right here's the biggie or a big example of what happens. Martin Luther comes along, he is the first, or he's the leader of the evangelical movement. But early on, there's a whole bunch of people, especially remember in the cities, who are humanists, they're intellectuals, they're clerks, uh, many university professors, all of them younger than Luther. This was a young generation. The Reformation was done by teenagers and people in their early 20s. Luther was an old man at age 34 when he uh, did his 95 Theses. Um, uh, th these people are all following Luther, and they're all, you know, charging ahead and standing up for justification by faith alone and taking care of the church and its superstitions, and suddenly they start uh, fighting amongst themselves because they're all reading the same Bible, they're all saying Scripture alone, but they're reading it differently. And... Uh, We'll, in the next slide, we'll deal with one aspect, but probably the most important division was over the understanding of the Lord's Supper. Uh, Luther, as you recall, the Roman Catholic Church saw the Lord's Supper, the Mass, as a way of gaining grace. Each Mass was worth so much grace. Not because, because you're actually reenacting the sacrament, the, the, the sacrifice of Christ on Golgotha reoccurs according to the Catholic understanding of the Mass. Every time there's a Mass. Now that's an infinite gift. 
But human beings are limited, so each human being would only get a small portion of it. They really did spend a lot of time thinking about if you have 300 people at a mass versus 100, you know, is it better to have how much grace do you get? <laughs> but these people are not dumb. They understand that if you have, uh, you know, is it like the miracle of the loaves and fishes, or is there, you know, is it better to have only 10 people? Uh, masses were being sent for people. Someone who was wealthy who was kind of worried about how much time he was going to spend in pur purgatory might, as one count did, endow 10,000 masses to be said for his soul after his death. Each one bumping him along the path to get him out of purgatory. So the mass has a certain quantitative uh, aspect of grace. And again, the social logic behind this is related to the penal notion, remember, uh, blood money and feuds and how you compute. Does everyone remember that was here? Yeah. I won't go into it that again. But so there's, it's a quantity. Luther, and so there is grace. There, there, uh, all three groups, the, the Catholics, the Lutherans, and the, and the um, Reformed, it's called Reformed according to the Word of God. These are Calvinists and the like, later day Presbyterians and UCC, the like, people like that. Um, they all said, yeah, the, the bread and the wine were visible signs of an invisible promise. Mark, yeah. can I ask you just one question? How much of the Catholic belief has stayed the same on that? How much is Lutheran belief has stayed the same? <laughs> it's changed. Remember, we always we take the larger society and the way we understand the world and we use that to understand the Christian message. And the world has changed for Catholics as well as for us. Formally speaking, uh, they still would say that the Mass has... Uh, that there's supernatural charity that's conveyed in every mass said, and so a multiplication of masses is good, and so on. So in formal theology, uh, there had not been a whole lot of change. But there's been different ways of interpreting them. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, so what is the sign? Well, in the Catholic, the sign is, is the bread and wine. It really turns into the body and blood of Christ, although it, may, it, it, it maintains the physical characteristics of bread and wine, and it conveys grace. Luther came, comes along, and because of his understanding of justification by faith alone, apart from works of the law, that is, you're saved by faith, which is something God does for you. Uh, it's a one-time thing. He says that it's a visible, the visible sign of the invisible promise. He puts his stress on the promise. When you stand in the, at the altar, the minister, the presiding minister, says, when he hands you the bread, or she, this is my body given for you. That's the promise. It's individualized to you. This is my blood shed for you. Now, Luther said in some mysterious way, Christ's body and blood really were present there, but not in the way of adding a little grace to us in the sense of supernatural charity. Rather, it is a way of announcing a promise to you, which you accept in faith. That is... Why did he say, well, all right, you could say that the bread and wine is the promise is there. The words are there. You, as long as you understand them and say amen or whatever, you don't have to say amen, but it's supposed to be. Um, what does it matter whether body is there or not? They fought over whether their body was truly present or not. The answer was, as Luther said, God's word, unlike human words, affect what they say. We can say, let there be light, unless someone pushes the switch back there, we don't have light, right? God said, let, let there be light, there's light. God's word affects what it does. And for Luther, that was very important. If you said that God, this wasn't in some mysterious way the body and blood of Christ, then you were doubting the promise. You're going to doubt the promise here, where are you going to believe the promise? But if you look at the, listen to the words carefully, it says, this is my body given for you. Do this in memory of me, or for memory of me. And the reform came along, and they said, okay, this is my body, that's a sign, but what are you doing for? You're doing it for memory of me. This is to help the people remember what Jesus did at one point. So the, the bread and the wine are not really, or don't nearly really need to be the body and blood of Christ. They're, rather, they're a sign to help the community remember and celebrate what God has done for them. And there are variations on that. That's one, of the, that's one of the divisions. They both have scripture. But Catholics have one view of what's going on. Lutherans have another view of what's going on. And the Reformed have a third. And they have consequences. The Catholics 
because it really turns into the body and blood of Christ and get grace. When you consecrated more hosts than you can use, you, you, you have to either consume them or you put them in a monstrance, a box that's either on the altar or behind the altar. You can take the host, which is the body of Christ, and put it in the box and carry it around the fields. Uh, there are all sorts of beliefs that, you know, uh, you had to have a plate under it so nothing would fall on the ground. Uh, people took it and sprinkled it on the on their crops. That was <coughs> trouble if they got caught. But the notion was that the, the, the host had almost this magical or what we think as a scientific somehow could affect a variety of things. Uh, Lutheran said, now look at if something falls on the ground, it's no longer being used sacramentally, so it's just bread and wine. Because it's not conjoined with the promise then. That's okay. Uh, uh, but still, you want to hear that promise as often as possible, so you should have you should go through the Eucharist at least once a week. And everyone commune. The Reform said, really, this is a memorial, and it's also subject to superstitions. The other thing we'll see in a moment is that the Reform, Reform according to the Word of God, were much were really down on anything they saw as superstitious or magical. So maybe it's better to do it only once a quarter, every three months. Now, you, some of you who are Lutheran say, hey, we, when I was growing up, we only did it once every three months. And that's because various other developments in, in pietism and what have you have a similar effect. So, if you say the Reformed are saying it's a memorial meal, there may be a presence, the Calvinists disagree with the swing wings and so on, but, uh, and it, but it's easily abused, people think it's magic, let's do it only once every, four times a year. The Lutherans say, well, you can't reserve it, and if it falls on the floor, it's okay, but, you know, it's the promise that we have. We want to hear the promise over and over again, we'll do it weekly. And the Catholics say, you know, it's pretty good if you can do it 10 or 12 times a day. <laughs> uh, these are names, uh, Karl Stott, Swangling, Eklampanis, that's a mouthful, Bootser. These are people, they were reformers at different places who followed the reform tradition, they took the notion, they stressed memory of me, and they were really down on superstition and magic, and Luther fought with them. It was horrendous. And Luther's conclusion was if they if they got this one wrong, they could only be of the devil. So he would have no truck with them. Uh, uh, States, reformer and forefather from a bunch of Puritan theology. Puritan, I hear that. That's weird. Calvin. I just, I could have Yeah, thank you. Uh, Calvin and second generation reformers. Calvin is a much younger man than Luther. And Luther and Calvin never meet. Uh, Calvin says, if I, if Luther reads some of Calvin's early work, says, if I could meet, talk with him, I think we would agree. Um, the Lutherans that come after Luther said that would be impossible. Uh, Calvin actually is fairly close to Luther in many things. Uh, and that's all you're going to hear about Calvin. From the, uh, one of the big issues that, that, that comes up with these different views, and I'll just mention this, is the problem of the unworthy. There are actually in the scripture, there's uh, Paul at one point talks about those who eat to their damnation, those who go to the supper and aren't really prepared, and remember the business about discipline? Uh, the Reformed Church were much more interested in making sure only the right people uh, went to the Eucharist. In the Catholic, you would go once a year, and you'd have to confess and be absolved before you would go. Uh, in the Lutheran, they turned to do it weekly. In the Reform, quarterly. But boy, before every quarter, uh, the church needed to make sure that the people who were not in right relationship with their neighbors and with God not communion. Because if the thought was, if you commune when you're not in right relation, uh, it's to your damnation. So there's a little bit of a magical thinking going on from a lot of perspective, too. Uh, and uh, later forms of Protestantism, I mean Lutheranism, also gets worried about the unworthy. And so, uh, especially the Missouri tradition, uh, uh, spends a lot of time making sure that the unworthy don't commune. And we today still could not commune with the Missouri Synod Church because we are the unworthy. Uh, it also, the, the Eucharist, which is supposed to be the symbol of the unity uh, of the Christian Church, uh, was an opportunity for mocking and murder. Uh, that is, 
The Protestants would get out and mock the Catholics as they were carrying around the Corpus Christi, or they make jokes about it. Uh, you know, that since the Catholics would take the host outside, you know, the, Catholic, the Protestants would show up and you know, jeer and what have you. And the Catholics would return the favor by murdering the people who were jeering. Uh, so, uh, this is one of the, the things for tremendous riots, especially in France, uh, but on, uh, between Catholics and Protestants over the Eucharist. Go to the next slide. And you'll be glad to know we're not going to get to the end. <laughs> uh, the word reformed, like you hear Christian reformed and Dutch reformed, uh, these folks, these evangelicals, took the perspective that they were reformed according to the word of God. Now, Luther would say, hey, I just reformed everything according to the word of God, too. So what was the difference? The Reformed, and, and many of those people that in the previous slide, Karl Stott, Luther, Echolon, Padius, Williams, um, uh, they made a distinction, a sharper distinction than Luther did, between divine law and human law. The issue of law and gospel, what does law do and what does gospel do? If you believe you're saved, not by what you do, but by what Christ has done for you. Christ has died on a cross for you, you accept that in faith. Then you do good works, but that's fruits of faith rather than the means by which you work out your salvation in cooperation with God. Uh, with that emphasis, law has really two roles in Lutheranism. Two, two roles. Um, and actually, uh, if you want to know what they were, I actually look under the third use of the law, you can see what the two are. The first is to disclose sinfulness and the inability to please God. This is really important for Luther. And this is the one that he would disagree with, where Anabaptists would go a different way and some Catholics would go a different way. He said that if you take the law seriously, you will soon realize, one, that you are sinful, you are selfish, and two, even though you might be really good for a short while, you will eventually fall back into your selfishness. So one use of the law, it's not that the law is bad. The law says you should love your neighbor as yourself. You should honor your mother and father. I mean, how many of you have always honored your mother and father? <laughs> how many of you have always been honored by your children? <laughs> uh, so it's not that you shouldn't be honored. You should. But human beings are not capable, you uh, would say. And Paul said uh, to uh, fulfill that. So one thing the law does is, is make you makes you despair, you would say. It makes you realize that you can't earn your own salvation. This was common property uh, in, the, in the church in the West. Catholics would agree to, maybe not ordinary lay Catholics, but the, the church, the theologians would agree. That's why grace had to be added. The church had to help. Uh, but so one use of the law is to disclose sinfulness and in your inability and put you in despair. Um, and then, of course, in that state, you are all set up for the good work, the message, the promise to come and really relieve you. You're saying, I can't do this, I'm going to hell, and you hear, God is, Jesus Christ has died for you, and you are saved. You've heard the promise, you accept that in faith, you're saved. And even faith is not a psychological work. So that's one use. The second one is there are a lot of people out there who are not going to be Christians, who are going to do bad things. And the law is there to deal with them. You know, the, the, the murderer, the robber, uh, the law is there to, you know, take care of them. And that's what Lutherans and Lutherans talk about. Those two uses of the law. One, to do, disclose sinfulness and your inability to be saved. And the second, to deal with wickedness. The reform came along and said, now remember, they're interested in discipline to exercise faith. You're not saved by what you do, but by God, you should be doing good things. How many of you heard of the Weber thesis? Uh, Weber was a sociologist in the early uh, 20th century. And he looked back at, and he made the argument, which actually is, I don't even know, the, the argument is, if you're in a group like the Reform, who believe in predestination, 
That is, God decides who's saved. And if you believe in what's called double predestination, God also decides who goes to hell. Luther believed in predestination too, but he tried to downplay the double part. Uh, and you say, well, am I saved or not? That's what the Puritans were so anxious about. Am I one of the elect? Am I saved? How do I know? How do I really assure myself that I'm saved? Well, if I do good works, maybe that's a sign that God has given me grace. Remember, the fruits of faith are supposed to result from being saved. But it also could be used as evidence that you are saved. And so you start having what is crudely obsessive compulsive disorders <laughs> among uh, Christians, uh, and especially among the Reformed, where they're busily looking at it. I mean, literally, the Puritans, are, who are a particularly strict form of Reform, are keeping diaries about what good things I did today as a way of reassuring himself or herself that they actually were among the elect. Um, so we've, we've jumped over this. I'm going to come back. I'll come back to this in a minute. But one of the, one of the developments that comes out of the Reformation, and particularly in the Reform, and later with Pietism within Lutheranism, is the development of the beginnings of modern individualism, which tied to religion, which is you start, not only are you interested in discipline, you're interested in self-discipline. When you start keeping obsessive lists about what you did, good and bad, for the day, you're involved in a practice which would have been really weird, um, or at least it would have been done differently. Uh, and you are you know, trying to fix yourself. You're using reason and the like, trying to figure out how to make yourself a better person. Uh, the 16th and 17th century saw this sort of interest in changing yourself spread all over. It was not just Protestant, Ignatian spirituality, which may not mean anything, but the Jesuits. His, his name is Ignatius of Loyola, the first Jesuit, so it's called Ignatian. Uh, they have what are called spiritual exercises. It's the beginning of going on retreats, you know, and, and going and being very introspective and, and the like. Uh, that has its origins in this period, and it has it particularly been the Reformed and the Puritan. And by God, they are the people that have caused our culture, <laughs> much of our culture here in New England. So welcome to your forebears. Uh, but let's go back. The last point I'm going to make, because we're almost out of time, about the Reform and the Lutherans is everyone agrees the authority is the Bible. But what does the Bible tell and teach you? Remember, the Reforms put more emphasis on divine law. Luther was against law. I mean, law. the two uses of the law, and they were positive, the law was still from God, but it was not a big part of Luther's uh, positive program. Uh, but a lot of his colleagues, these younger people, said, yeah, we get rid of papal law, we get rid of superstitions, we get rid of an understanding of the mass you can't find in the Bible, or we get rid of the rosary that you can't find in the Bible, or we get rid of relics which you can't find in the Bible, or we get rid of pilgrimages which you can't find in the Bible, um, and, uh, and we do only what's in the Bible. Here the division is, you could say, the Bible tells us what to do, I mean, what is right. There's two ways you can look at it. You take everything that the positive the Bible says, and you make sure you don't violate that. Or you could say, so you say, uh, you shouldn't do any. You should you should get rid of the elevation. You should get rid of certain things with the mass because they suggest it's a good work that we're doing. But you still have the mass or the Eucharist. Uh, you uh, it says take and eat. Okay, you could take the bread and wine, but if it's, if it's put in your mouth by the priest, it's okay. There is one way of saying, all right, there's a minimum number of things you have to do, and there's another way, of, an expansive way that says we've got to do everything exactly the way the Bible says it. We either make sure that we avoid the things that are wrong, or we have to do everything that's right. And the reform were of the expansive version. So they said, not only do you not do the things the Bible prohibits, you have to do everything that the Bible says that you, you're supposed to do, and nothing that it doesn't say you're supposed to do. 
So let's take something. Uh, uh, it, there is no mention in the Bible of organs. Not, yeah. I'm talking about the music organ. Playing music. I mean, there, yeah, there's there's hymns and lyres and what have you in the in the Psalms, but no organs, right? So what does Ulrich Swingman do in Turkey? He goes and he literally nails shut the organs. No, you know, I'm not supposed to be singing. He's not playing organs. You can sing, but you can't have an organ. Or uh, there's a prohibition against graven images. Luther said, well, as long as you don't worship them, it's all right to have pictures in church. Swingman says, no, it's prohibited, and so they whitewash. The great uh, Grossmünster in Zurich. The great. They, they finally have now recovered the pictures. They were actually well preserved because they put whitewash over them. <laughs> um, the reform come along and they are they are much more strict about trying to figure out exactly what you're supposed to do and not do and using the, the biblical model. Lutherans develop another notion which comes out of the fancy uh, Greek. Uh, a word in the language of adiaphora. Those things which are indifferent to salvation. Whether you take the toast, the, the bread, in your hand or put it in your mouth, or whether the host is elevated or not, whether you have an organ playing or not, uh, it doesn't matter. As long as you have the word properly preached and the sacraments rightly administered. You think, oh God, why is Mark talking about this? The fights that the church is having right now is over the question of adiaphora. It doesn't mean whether it is ordaining gays and lesbians or uh, oh, any range of things. The question is, does that distinguish what is the true church from the false? In the Reformed, they would often say yes. The Lutherans in the early period would say no. Not that they would accept a lot of things we accept today. Um, but they would but in terms of what is needed to be saved and how one identifies the true church, that would be adiaphora. And so this is the theological idea we fight. And it thinks it seems to me like that's a good thing to end this series with. Any questions? Mark? Yeah. To clarify, you could be on either the re reform tradition would then uh, end up having reform groups that said on, say, some social issue, yes, it's okay over here, yes, it's okay over there. There's nothing about the tradition that dictates today's political issues that are No, not. In, in fact, uh, it's just that they have a, a wider scope of sense of discipline within the community and what matters. But no, I wasn't, you know, to be reformed doesn't mean that you're going to take one side or the other of a lot of these contemporary issues. It's just that you might say that's the true church for the soul. And you'd say, well, now look, the Lutherans themselves are dividing over the ordination of things unless it was a new Lutheran core group. Uh, you know, what happened to Adiaphora? Well, then we have to spend a whole, a long period giving the history of Lutheranism and develops. Lutherans are great with fighting with each other. Uh, how many of you are Norwegian Lutheran? Okay. In about 1912, there were nine different Norwegian Lutheran synods in the Midwest, none of them speaking with each other. So, uh, I mean, that if that won't, it doesn't symbolize what Lutherans are capable of, I know nothing that does. Okay, thanks a lot.